We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. I wanted to, to, to recognize a couple things that are going on in this space that are so exciting and make sure you know about them too. Uh, God is working at ACC in such a really cool and powerful way. And some of the things sometimes you don't even know they're happening. Uh, but one of the things you probably recognize is this service is starting to get a little, a little close, right? You're starting to not have a place to put your jacket. Your jacket no longer has a seat. So we're excited about that. You know, this week we actually added 44 more chairs into the room to be able to make room for, for the growth. Um, and that kind of scooted you guys. Yeah, isn't that exciting? Um, so we now have like a pastoral spit zone. It's a splash zone right here. I, I'll try not to, but um, anyway, as we're, as we're making some changes around here, you got to see that we, we baptized four people this morning. In fact, we have a, yeah, we have a... Last song of this service. I know we have told we have another baptism, so we're going to do another one today. Next week, we have more baptisms scheduled. The week after that, we have baptisms scheduled. You see, God is working, and we're excited to be a part of it, and I'm glad that you're here. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as the lead pastor, and uh, we're, we're in the middle of a series right now called, uh, it's going through the book of Daniel. It's called How to Thrive in Babylon. We're looking at what it looks like for those of us who are followers of Christ, those of us who have a certain set of, of uh, uh, values and a worldview and something that might be different and contrary to the culture that we live in, what does it look like to live in a culture that is kind of uh, opposed to your way of, of understanding what's true and what's good? How do we thrive in that culture? And Daniel isn't just a book of child stories about lion's den and, and the fiery furnace and all that stuff. It's actually an instruction manual for each of us on how we can thrive in our own version of Babylon, how we thrive in this culture. So we're looking through it together. We're exploring some things. On the first week, we got a basic lesson on how to thrive in Babylon. We saw Daniel do four different things. Go back and watch that if you missed it. Uh, last week, Pastor Michael uh, showed us how Daniel went from just kind of being one of the guys that are part of the servants of the king, how he interpreted a dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, and he did it accurately, and it was this, this big statue, and he told the king what it was all about, and, and because he accurately uh, explained and interpreted this dream, King Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel essentially the prime minister of all of Babylon and brought him and his friends up to like areas of, of prominence. So that's what we talked about last week. And that really brings us to where we're going to be at today. But if you think about it, what happened last week was something pretty amazing. King Nebuchadnezzar was likely very impressed with Daniel. But we see that his heart wasn't transformed. He saw something powerful happening through Daniel's interpretation of his dream. But it wasn't enough to change his heart. And so King Nebuchadnezzar still isn't recognizing or willing to recognize that there is one true king, one true God, and that King Nebuchadnezzar is not it, all right? So that's the problem we find ourselves in here in Daniel chapter 3. So as you open up your copy of God's Word, I want to encourage you to go to Daniel 3. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, uh, just put your name in the Bible that you see in front of you and write, write your name in it and take it with you. That's yours to keep. We want you to have a Bible. All right, so Daniel chapter 3, as you open to it, a little bit of context. Babylon is, is uh, basically a world power at the time. It continues to be a world power as this is happening. King Nebuchadnezzar is the king over the largest world power. In fact, Babylon is the greatest city and empire in the pre-Christian era. 
If you remember Daniel's dream that he interpreted, the head of the statue represented the Babylonian kingdom, and that was the part of the statue that was made out of gold. That was like the, the big deal kingdom. And then it rep- the other parts of the statue represented other kingdoms that were to come that were lesser than gold. So Babylon is a really big deal, and it's likely getting to King Nebuchadnezzar's head. And what we're going to see in Daniel chapter 3 is how he takes what uh, the the situation that he finds himself in, himself in, and he starts to create what I would call a counterfeit version of what God has already instilled. He creates counterfeits of all sorts of different things, and we're going to see that as we read together. So, Chapter 3, there was a dream about a statue. So speaking of statues, let's read in Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says this, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then he sent messages to all the high officers and the officials and the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the political provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before King Nebuchadnezzar, the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So he he builds this statue. It says 90 feet tall. If you want to get a, a visual picture of what that would look like, you know, most ceilings in our homes are about eight feet tall. So you look at it, it's about a 10 to 11 story building. That's how tall this gold statue was. If you want to still, you're like, I'm having a hard time picturing that. Uh, drive down to, uh, on Ritchie Highway until you get to Empire Towers. I don't know why they put an S on that because I only see one of them. But Empire Towers right across the street from Bubba's. And that's about 11 stories tall. So that's a 90 feet tall building. So King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this gold statue. This is the first counterfeit that he really creates. He creates, uh, we, we recognize that there is one true God that is worthy of our worship, but King Nebuchadnezzar creates this gold statue, and he creates, uh, basically we assume in his likeness, and he tells people that they're going to now worship him. He wants to set up a kingdom where he is the God, a counterfeit God. And so that's the first little piece of counterfeit that is created. It's pretty important. If you think about, um, remember on Easter, Sometimes you get a, a basket full of candy, and sometimes in that basket there was like a chocolate bunny, right? And you would be excited because it was like this big. It's like huge, so much chocolate. And then you bite into the ear and you find out it's what? Hollow, right? So I'm thinking, I wonder if King Nebuchadnezzar's statue is 90 feet tall, but it's just kind of plated with gold, or if the whole thing was gold. Now, I'm I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us really clearly, but it does say he set it up and he made it out of gold. And if we think about the dream that Daniel had told him in in Daniel chapter 2, that that there was a problem, right? The the head was gold and everything else that was lesser quality and and more destructible than gold, uh, or uh, you could be broken, the clay and the the iron, that that when Jesus comes, it's going to smash that and all these kingdoms are going to fall. Uh, We assume that that King Nebuchadnezzar made this statue out of pure gold. Think about it. He went into Jerusalem, and the Lord allowed him to conquer Jerusalem and take uh, some of the priceless treasures out of the temple and kind of uh, take and plunder all of God's people. He, He likely took all that gold, and he's now created out of things that used to be holy that God set up, that God ordained, and he creates this new statue, 90 feet tall, and he calls all the people, It says, everybody, you're going to come and and see this thing. So then we hear the next counterfeit, all right? So we have a counterfeit God now. King Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's worthy of of being worshipped as God. He set up this statue of himself. But now we're going to see a counterfeit pastor. Now King Nebuchadnezzar sends out a pastor to, to preach to the people. And here's what he says. It says, then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, I don't know what any of these instruments are, that's okay. Harp, uh, it says pipes, but I'm going to say bagpipes because that sounds cooler. Bagpipes and other musical instruments, bow bow to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. 
Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Here we see some other counterfeits, right? You have a counterfeit pastor, and he gets up in front of all the people, and he preaches to them, and he says, listen, in just a moment, this counterfeit worship band is going to play some songs, and when they play some songs, you are going to bow down to this counterfeit God, and if you don't, you'll be sent to my counterfeit hell. I'll put you in a blazing furnace unless you worship the God that we have set up in the form of a statue. You see these counterfeits that all look kind of like the the true God's setup of things, but it's all counterfeit. And so this this herald tells everybody that they must do it or they're going to be thrown into this blazing furnace. You think about what he says though. He says anyone uh, that, that as soon as you hear this music, you are to bow down and worship this statue. This word worship, it's important for us to understand what this word means. You know, worship is really a, a word that means, it, it, it's, it's when you ascribe worth to something. If, if something is worthy of, of your praise, you're, you're, you're worshiping it. So you're, when it's worthy, you're, you're ascribing worth to it. And what King Nebuchadnezzar does here is very interesting. He, he tells people by force that they must worship this idol. Think about this for a moment. King Nebuchadnezzar has created this counterfeit uh, concept, all these counterfeits, and he says, you must worship. But do you recognize that our God is so good and so loving to each of us that he doesn't force anybody to worship him? There's not a single one of you in this room that will have to, listen, if you do not want to spend eternity with God, you won't won't have to. He loves you enough to give you a choice about whether or not you want to be in relationship with him. And in, in the case of how and where we worship, he loves you enough that he allows you to decide who you worship or what you worship. But King Nebuchadnezzar's plan is different. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to, the music's going to play, and you will worship this statue. You will worship me. It's interesting. If you think about idols for a moment, we, in the, this Western culture, right, it's not often that, that you're probably tempted to bow down and worship a golden statue. So what is it that we worship in this culture? What are the idols that you and I find ourselves struggling that the culture tells us, listen, you have to bow down to these things. These are the things that are worthy of your worship. These are the things that you should worship. What does the culture tell us in our culture to worship? And think about it. There's three Ps. One of them is is possessions. The things that we like to, we like to work hard and save up some stuff and buy some things and go on some things and we like to, to, to buy a bunch of stuff and those things often are the things that we, we place and, and give more value to God. There's also this concept of, of pleasure. Pleasure is, is, is uh, something that when we uh, want that, that feeling of happiness, we want that feeling of joy, that we'll go out and we'll actually sometimes put those things, those experiences on a higher plane than God. And then there's also this concept of prominence or power. Sometimes the concept of fame or people knowing our name or having this position of authority, that that, that prominence is more important to us than worshiping God. Because if you think about the definition of an idol— An idol is simply anything we put above our love and devotion and relationship to God. Anything that we put above our love, our devotion, and our relationship to God is really what we're doing is we're saying, we're going to place that thing on a pedestal, we're going to then bow down to it, and we're going to give our attention and affection to that thing instead of to the God who created that thing or made that thing possible for us. And see, the truth is, We're probably not tempted in this culture to bow down to a gold statue, but we have our own idols. We have things that the culture says, listen, you gotta bow down to this thing. You gotta run after this. You gotta grab this. You gotta hang on to this. You gotta experience this. And the culture wants you to bow down to these idols. And by the way, these idols aren't bad. Sometimes you'll hear a pastor talk about buying stuff or going out on experience and whatever. Listen, 
In fact, in, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says this, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. What this scripture reminds us of is that God gives us uh, stuff. God, God's the source of some of the possessions that you have. He's the one who provides some incredible experiences and the pleasure, right? He says he gives us these things for, uh, for our enjoyment. God's the one who sets up people in positions of authority. God does the, the p- power and, uh, p- uh, you know, possessions and and prosperity, all those things. None of those things are bad in and of themselves. What they are, though, is is they're they're tempting to place them on on a pedestal and to worship them more than you worship the God who gave them to you. And we should not do that. The Bible's really clear about that. And so King Nebuchadnezzar and his culture, he's saying, listen, you need to bow down. So the story continues in verse 7. And this is the instruction So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed down to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So now we're at the point where the music plays, the counterfeit worship experience starts, and all the people present, experts would say that there's somewhere between 30,000 people present, all the way up to possibly 300,000 people present at this worship experience. The music starts to play, and the scriptures say that every single person bows down, except three. It says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, the three friends of Daniel, don't bow down. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what about Daniel? What did he do? Why did Daniel, uh, why, why do we not get to hear about Daniel? Did he bow down? It sounds like he did. But here's, uh, I want you to understand, we know Daniel's heart. We know that Daniel is a man who has made a resolute decision. Daniel is not one that would have bowed down. So Daniel likely isn't present. Here's what I believe happened. I believe that King Nebuchadnezzar knew in this moment, Daniel is very important to my, my uh, ruling of this, this whole kingdom. He's, he's very crucial to my plan. He's very talented. He's very good. And I know he won't bow down when that music plays. So he probably sent Daniel out on some sort of foreign business. Daniel, I can't have you here on this weekend because it'll make me look really bad. So Daniel's not around 30,000, maybe 300,000 people present. The music starts to play, and only three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are still standing. That's interesting. I want you to understand that these three guys, they cut their teeth in, in their childhood on the Ten Commandments. They, they know very well because they had parents who poured into them. When, when they were young, they had parents who taught them the, the truth of God. They taught them how to, how to recognize something as counterfeit so that when something counterfeit gets set up, you don't bow down to it. And they, they know the Ten Commandments, right? The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, right? Not to have any graven images or idols that you would worship and bow down to. These guys, uh, there's like 600 commandments. Uh, they, they, they probably maybe don't have all of them memorized, but they know these 10 because their parents have poured into them and told them, listen, one day the culture is gonna make you and force you to bow down to something other than this, but I want you to know the truth. And when you experience it, I want you to stand strong. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bow down to it. Just three remain standing. You think about this for a moment. When God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar to go into Jerusalem and have victory over it and take these men and women out of Jerusalem and into Babylon, they took more than just Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's a whole bunch of other people who should have known the truth, who should have stayed standing, who shouldn't have bowed down to this idol, but they did. And think about that for a moment. What are some of the things that probably go through your head? If you were in the same situation, I, I bet none of us have ever been in a situation before where someone said, listen, if you don't bow down at this moment, you're going to die. But think about it for a moment. If we were put in that situation ourselves, it's really easy for us all to say right now, oh, I would stay standing. 
But I'm looking at these odds. Only three actually did it. Like, what would we do? What would you do? What would I do? I think what we would do for, for many of us is we'd come up with these really clever excuses to justify bowing down to this thing. Let me give you an example of some of those. One of those excuses I call the just this once excuse. Listen, he's probably not going to do this test again. He's going to play this music this one time. We're just going to bow down this one time. It's just this once. It's just what God show me a little bit of grace. I'm just going to bow down this once. It's not a big deal. That's what many of us would probably do. Or the no one will know excuse. That one sounds like this. Would, there's like 30,000 people around me. Would anyone really pay attention if I just bowed down? Or the peer pressure excuse. That one's pretty simple. Everyone else is doing it. All my, my Jewish brothers and sisters that came out of captivity or you know, came, came into captivity with me, they're doing it. Well, I guess we're, we're good now. Peer pressure. What about the justification excuse? This one's really tricky. This is the one I think would trip a lot of us up. You ready for this? Well, you know, if I bow down, it's actually a way that I could show love to people who maybe see things differently than me. If I bow down this once, I would actually be able to open up some windows of opportunity to, to one day share the truth. But if I don't bow down, I'm shutting off all those conversations. So really the most loving thing for me to do, and in order not to offend those around me who see the world differently than I do, the most loving thing, the thing God would want me to do, is to bow down to this idol. Or maybe the human reasoning excuse I'm better off alive than dead. How useful can I be for the kingdom if I get thrown into a furnace? So I might as well just do this and, and then God can keep using me afterwards. This last one I call the loophole excuse or the loophole strategy. This is probably the one that I, I'm kind of a clever thinker. I would probably kind of try to think through something like this. Here's the loophole excuse. I hear that King Nebuchadnezzar has told me that as soon as the music plays, I got to bow down to this idol. And I'm thinking, okay, that's about to happen. I'm going to untie my shoes real quick. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, music. All right, all right. I got to tie my shoe. I'm just tying my shoe. I don't know what everyone else is doing, but I was just tying my shoe. <laughs> the loophole strategy. Would you have that kind of courage and faith? In this case, 0.01% of the dudes there stayed standing. Or would you cave under the pressure of the culture around you? See, in verses 8 through 12, the tattletales show up in the story. All the other guys show up. Not only tattletales, but they're also kind of kiss-ups, right? They, they go to the king and they're like, oh, great king. You're so amazing. Boy, do we got a story for you. Have any of you have siblings? You know what tattletaling is, right? You know that there's somehow some, something innately in us that gets kind of some sick pleasure for watching someone else get punished when we've done something right. I happened to do it right this time, and my sister did not. I'm telling, right? You go, right? To, to, it's like we want to watch somebody else go through the punishment that we won't have to experience in that moment. And that's what happens. These tattletales show up, and they, they say this whole thing to the king. It probably sounds something like this. Oh, great, wonderful king. Oh, man, you are so good. You are, you, man, everything you say is Mm, great. Well, you remember that one thing you said where you said when that music played that everyone had to then bow down and worship the idol? Remember that? Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, we remember that. We did that. Uh, but then remember you also said that if you don't do it, that you'd have to get thrown into a furnace. Remember that? Yeah, that's why we bowed down. We're, we're good. But would you, you know what? Now that I think about it, there are three guys that you've actually placed in authority over us that didn't do it. And they go straight to the king and they tattle. They go to the king and say, these three guys didn't bow down. It just reeks of jealousy. Let me show you in Daniel 3, 12. 
This is the, the last part of their, their little tattling. It says, but there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Notice here that they use their, their false identity names. Not the names God gave them, but the name that the king gave them. And says, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. These guys are coming up saying, hey, these three guys that somehow are, have, have, were taken out of Jerusalem and have been raised up and somehow now are in charge of us, these three guys didn't do what you said. It says, they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Man, it just reeks of jealousy, doesn't it? You hear the jealousy in their voice. Whatever they can do to get these three guys in trouble, they're willing to do it. They throw them under the bus. And what I want to show you, four things real quickly this morning, of what you should expect when you stand up when everyone else bows down. Right? When you are thriving in Babylon, when you uh, follow that, that path that we talked about on week one, and you choose the path that's going to lead you to thrive in Babylon, when you thrive in Babylon... When you stand when everyone else is bowing, you should expect a few things. And here's the first thing I want you to expect. Expect jealousy. Let me explain what I mean by that. See, this culture tells the world around us that the way to happiness, the way to joy, the way to pleasure, it points to all sorts of things. Go after this and it will give you happiness. Go after this and it will give you joy. Go after this and go after that. And the world around you is trying to find purpose and meaning in all sorts of broken things and they're chasing after it and chasing after it and that doesn't work so they chase after something else. But then what happens is when they see you and I, if we're followers of Christ who are choosing not to bow and we're standing firm, we're standing resolute on what's good, and we're actually experiencing the abundant life that God has for us in that. We're experiencing the joy. And listen, it doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. But your friends are going to see something bad happen in your life, and you're going to be like, you know what? I still got joy because I got Jesus. They're going to see that kind of attitude in you, and they're going to hate it. They're going to wonder because they chose to go after everything else that the culture's offering. They're going to be so frustrated that you somehow are thriving. And that jealousy is going to seek, seek in, sink in. Here's the second thing you should expect that we're going to see here. You should expect anger. The culture will not be happy that you don't bow down to the things the culture tells you to bow down to. When the culture tells you to bow down, recognize it is a command. The culture is telling you, you must bow down to the things of this culture. And when you choose not to, it's going to make the people around you very angry. Let's look at that in verse 13. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And notice he's calling them again by their, their false identities, their, their names that he gave them. He says that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up. In fact, if you look over at verse 19, it says that he was so angry that his face was distorted with rage. Have you ever been that mad? Some experts actually believe that he was so mad that in that moment he got Bell's palsy and his face became distorted with anger. I don't know if that's true. Uh, one thing I do know is this morning I went to all of the, the people who you've seen on stage this morning and I asked them to give me a, a picture of them with their face so angry that it's distorted. And some of them did okay. I'll share with you. Here's, here's the first one. That's Nick, our drummer. It looks a little more like Popeye to me, right? Um, here's another one. Pastor John went the same route. All right, next one. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, Belinda, I don't know if she can actually be mad. So that's why this didn't translate very well. Here's the next one. Uh, Rich did pretty good. All right. The next one, here's Pastor Michael, I think. I think when he, I said, give me your angry face, what he heard was give me your constipated face. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. Uh, the next one, uh, there's TJ. Uh, all right. And then I think the last one here is Gary. Um, I, I, I'll let him be mad at me anytime. That looks great. Um, 
Anyway, here's my point, is that the king was mad. The culture was mad that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down. And the culture will be mad at you when you don't bow down. It will. Here's the third thing. Number three, expect bully tactics veiled as grace. Expect bully tactics veiled as an act of kindness. Let me, let me read what this looks like here. Verse 15. This is King Nebuchadnezzar speaking. He says, I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue. He said, listen, I'm such a nice guy that I'm going to, listen, let's overlook what just happened. I know my face looks really, really uh, frustrated right now. I'm going to overlook that because out of the kindness of my heart, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm now going to graciously give you another chance to bow down. He says, when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, he basically goes to the worship team and says, hey, counterfeit worship team, we got to play that song one more time. Play it again. There are three guys that must not have heard it. He says, but if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. Oh, that last sentence says so much. First of all, King Nebuchadnezzar is right. He used the lowercase g. There is no lowercase g that's going to be able to survive, uh, that's going to be able to save you from the furnace. There's only one true God, the uppercase G God, that has the ability to save you from the fiery furnace. But King Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's that powerful. He's like, oh yeah, well what God is going to save you from this thing? This bully tactic that's kind of veiled as grace. One really great example of this that many of you have probably experienced is in the form of a timeshare presentation. <laughs> Think about this for a moment. You walk into that room and they assign someone to you, right? And they're sitting down across the table from you. And it is amazing in those moments how the person that you're speaking to in that moment is incredibly friendly. I mean, it seems like everything that you love, they love. They'll immediately say, oh, what do you do for, for a living? Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, it's amazing how I'm a brother in Christ too, right? Every single one of them, they all love Jesus like I do. They all love the same things I do. And by 10 minutes into the conversation, I'm convinced that we should be best friends. Like that kind of friendliness. But the moment in that conversation, you get to a point where they realize you are not going to be purchasing anything. Oh, that goes away so quick, doesn't it? Like the, the bully tactics, I had one, one guy said to me, he started questioning my manhood. He's like, well, do you not love your wife? Are you not man enough to make this decision without her approval? I'm like, wow. Our friendship just took a turn. <laughs> like, I don't know what's happened. Like, it's mean. One guy looked at me and he's like, why, why do you even, are you just here to waste my time? No, I came for the water park tickets. <laughs> no. Anyway. Listen, this culture will use this strategy of grace and kindness. They'll offer you uh, uh, open arms into their community of whatever it is that they're selling. We love you. We care about you over here and this, uh, accept the ways of the culture and you will be embraced and we, we care about you far more than whoever is on the other side of this thing. But the truth is that the moment this culture recognizes that you are not going to bow down, you're going to notice a switch gets flipped real quick. Expect it. Daniel, if we keep reading in verse 16, this is how they replied. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. I don't know if anyone probably has ever talked to King Nebuchadnezzar this way. It says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Notice that they say your majesty. Remember we learned on week one that we need to balance truth with grace. We need to be respectful in how we communicate truth. 
And here they are, they're still recognizing that King Nebuchadnezzar has been placed in a position of authority, that he has been placed in this position by God, that God allowed him to pull them out of Jerusalem and into Babylon. And here they say, your majesty. It says, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. They're incredibly direct. Here's a fourth thing you should expect if you say something like that to this culture. Expect persecution. Expect that the culture is going to persecute you for making such a bold statement that you are not going to bow down to the culture around you. It says the king gets really, really mad. This is where his face distorts. He's so mad. And he orders that the furnace, which is probably already hot enough, to, that is probably the furnace they use to make this gold statue. And gold takes a lot of heat to, to melt, right? He takes that furnace and he says, listen, make it seven times hotter than it already is. In fact, it's so hot that he orders Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be tied up and thrown into it, right? The guys who take him, them, and throw them into the furnace, those guys are consumed with the fire and burned up and killed instantly. That's how hot this furnace is. And God uh, allows this all to happen. And so it says in verse 23, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied fell into the roaring flames. Let me say it again. Expect persecution. Expect that this culture is going to tie you up and throw you into the fire. That's what they're going to do. Now remember on week one, we talked about that that four-step plan of how to thrive in Babylon. We saw that Daniel decided, number one, you need to be resolute. You need to decide right now that when the time comes to bow, you're not going to do it. And then we also saw Daniel say, listen, you also need to balance grace and truth in this culture. You need to be willing to say truthful things, but in a graceful way. And then we also learned that Daniel said, and you need to understand the culture around you, but not give in to it. And then the fourth thing we learned from Daniel is that when you do that, God shows up and shows off. And what happens here is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they follow that four-step plan. They say, number one, we're resolutely not going to bow down to you, king. We're going to tell it to you with grace and truth. We recognize that everyone else around us is bowing down, but we're not going to do it. And then the fourth thing that happens is they get to watch God show up and show off. Now, some of you might be thinking, what? How, how's God showing off? These guys got thrown into a fire. How's that good? Well, you probably just don't know the story. Let me show you in verse 24. It says, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Well, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. This is a theological word called a theophany. It's where basically we see the person of Jesus in the Old Testament appearing in person, and he's walking around in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're no longer bound. I mean, whatever ropes they tied them up with, those have already burned off, and they're just walking around in the fire with Jesus. And Nebuchadnezzar is looking in, and he's watching this happen. It says that Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants, (laughs) servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego stepped out of the fire, and then the high officers, the officials, the governors and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed. Their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. You see, what can God do? God can show off as the culture around you persecutes you. I wrote down a couple things to, to kind of close with. One is the furnace, which looked like the end of their lives, turned out to be the greatest thing they ever experienced. The culture said, we're going to throw you into a fire. This is the worst thing you will ever experience in your life. And they walk in there and they got to experience Jesus. Man. Here's what we see. You see, God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
in the furnace, not from the furnace. Don't miss this. He, he saved them in the furnace. He didn't save them from the furnace. In other words, you're going to experience trials. This culture is going to persecute you. You're going to experience some really difficult things. But recognize that God's not necessarily going to save you from that persecution. He's going to save you in that persecution. He's going to be with you in that persecution. He's going to guard you and protect you while you're being persecuted. And some of you right now are saying, but, but I've read the book of martyrs. I know that sometimes God's people stand firm and they get placed into a fire and God doesn't show up and they get burned up. They get killed in that moment. What is that all about? Well, I love that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they even say to King, listen, our God's going to save us, but even if he doesn't, he's still going to show up and show off. Because here's the deal. Don't, don't miss this. You ready? Sometimes God delivers people from the fire. Sometimes God delivers people in the fire. And sometimes God works through the aftermath of the fire. Sometime you might be persecuted and you might feel like, you know what, at the end of it, you got consumed by the fire. You look in scripture about what happened to Stephen. You look in a scripture about what happened to the apostles as they're martyred for their faith. The truth is, God, when you stand firm and you show grace and truth and you don't give in as the rest of the culture does, God will always show up and show off. He will always show up and he will always show off because that's the kind of God he is. So our what now, because I'm way over time this morning, let's, let's keep it real simple. I want to ask you to check yourself, to ask yourself a hard question. If the culture around you is bowing down to idols, are you going to give in? Are you willing to stand firm? Maybe even ask yourself, what is it that you idolize? All of us in this room, if we're honest, there's things that we've placed in higher priority in our lives than our relationship with Christ. Let's recognize those things, call them out, and get rid of them so that we can bow down before the one true God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for being good. Thank you for showing us this example of what to expect when we thrive in Babylon. I pray right now that you'd show us, every single one of us, some areas in our own lives where we've placed things in an area of, of importance above our devotion and relationship to you. God, call those things out in our spirit right now. Help us to recognize those things and to lay them at your feet and to give them up and to recognize that you are the only one worthy of our praise and worship. God, help us to thrive as we're persecuted, as we see jealousy, as we see all these things that we should expect, God, as, as the world does what the world's going to do. As they try to bully us into submission. Help us to stand firm for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.